On the course website is a PDF with the revised project update. As all good engineering projects, they go into multiple revisions, and this one is no exception. There's a few things that have been changed on this project and a few things that we added. What we added is that time requirement is equal to 250 tunes. You can look at that and justify it your, the way that you might want to justify it yourself, but that's a reasonable number from my perspective. Um, but still make sure that that is reasonable. The viscosity is fixed for everyone, and let's not make it temperature dependent. It's pretty much a weak function of temperature in this instance, so let's fix it at a constant for all species and reduce one value to simplify it. Cabin size of the catalyst, 5 millimeters, ambient temperature, 100 degrees C. Tube outer diameter, 4.2 millimeters, is also the tube inner diameter. And then the heat uh, transfer coefficient is not revised, I just updated the units, so it's worth the units per I can be correct in the units. What is revised quite substantially are the rate constants, K1 and K2. So please divide them by a million on each side. We will need to do an additional division to get the units into SI. So what this is, is simply just to the existing units, so I don't you know, emphasize that, but just the uh, with existing units. So the existing units are in liters per mole second. Um, so you may, you will need to do an additional unit conversion beyond this. So if this is confusing for you, a uh, better way of showing this change is in the PDF on the course website. So please check that out. Make sure you update. This won't affect any of you from what I've seen where you are in your progress. Um, many of you haven't got to investigating the thermal effects yet, where some of these aspects are important, and many of you have not done the pressure drop effects yet, so those aspects. Um, if you have done it, you probably assume values are similar to that if you, if you pick reasonable values to, to the situation. And the only one that might affect some of you is K1, K2, and we'll try to find the bottom in this temperature pressure. But you've all written those in MATLAB scripts, and so you can just read that simulation. Any questions on the course project so far? I will be available on Monday's tutorial for the full two hours. I do that we'll get the Tuesday tutorial, and the, the handling is done on Thursday. Also, the revised PDF is the requirement to submit your MATLAB code in working form, so I should be able to take your MATLAB code, run it as is, and generate the final profile for the flows and temperatures and pressures. And I will be doing that. Okay, so uh, you will submit your MATLAB code. No non-working MATLAB code or MATLAB code that's not submitted at all um, will result in penalties. So we do we do need to verify the submission. Okay, so the sequence class is a bit, a bit of theory, <laughs> a lot of theory. Um, we will, I will, what I will do though is just give, give us some perspective. Let's just step back and see what we've done, right? So we've, the past two weeks, we've gone into quite a lot of detail on blood flow reactors and temperature effects. Let's just step back a bit and see where we've come from. Where we started here with this section is really multiple reactions. So I'm going to go back, this is pretty much going back seven or eight classes, just to give some perspective. And for multiple reactions, we look at selectivity, we look at overall yield, and we look at conversion. And we use those three metrics to judge what type of reactor to use. And also how to operate our reactor. So which temperatures for and pressures. So those are the three metrics we, we mainly use to judge our system. And we also, in this section on multiple reactions, we derived a plan that works for all multiple reaction systems. And that plan is right up the design equation. reactor for all species. Okay. 
Okay, so we had n species. So that means you've got n equations over here. Okay, so this results in n equations. We also write out the rates for all the reactions. And we have Q, Q reactions, so lowercase Q reactions. So what that meant in the previous class, we used this notation Rij. of the concentrations, we have n species, so Ca, Cb, up to the general species is Cj, and the final species is Cn. So J is 1, 2, up to n, the number of species that we have. I, I mentioned that I is equal to 1, up to 2, up to Q, for the number of reactions. We've got Q reactions, J, uh, J equals 1, 2, 3, up to N species. We'll be able to get a rate for every species in every reaction. You can just make a note here that many of these are zero. Many of those Rij values are zero if the species doesn't participate in a particular reaction. And then we can get uh, Rj net. So for the J species, we can calculate the net rate as the sum of the rates. So R1j plus R2j plus plus plus. All the way up to the final reaction. So there will be one rate for that species J. mass balances. So maybe we should emphasize that we have n of these oh, mass balance yeah. equations. I should let mole balance be more than that. If we consider the thermal effects and pressure effects, we have additional equations. So activity is often used to decide which type of reactor. Once you've fixed your reactor, then you use yield and conversion to decide on operating conditions for all that No, but if you have a single reaction, but you can use conversion of a particular raw material to a final product. There's undesired species and desired, so you can use conversion in desired species or can is a valid way. That's often used to specify your profitability. If you want to use and you want to ensure that your raw material gets converted over to your desired product and not to undesirable. So then the yield is a valid way and so is the conversion of that judging that. And those are for the pressure effects and for temperature effects. 
So that would be dy by dw. expansion and contraction. A lot of people are asking where is epsilon, why is it much featuring? This is already that's accounted for in there. Okay, so if you use that equation there for CJ, it, it takes care of expanding and contracting systems. Ft, another question that's come up, is Ft a constant? No, Ft is not a constant. Ft is the sum of the individual flows. So just add that Ft is Fa plus Fb, and so on, up to my final species, Fa. the temperature effects in some of our other reactors, in CSTRs and in batch reactors. So let's take a look at those, come back to that. Actually, we did look a little bit at it and uh, moved on from it quite rapidly. Let's come back and just spend a little bit more time looking at those and, and make that our focus of this evening's class. So what I mean by that is we had earlier looked at at temperature, and we did a fairly intensive energy balance. Let's just recap that we had the E, the energy in the system by, by time, and we said that that's equal to zero in steady state. We showed that that's equal to the rate of heat transfer into the system minus the shaft work done by the system summed over i equals 1 to n, the number of species that I have, and we used uh, fi coming in, multiplied by its enthalpy at the entrance, minus, again, summing from i equals 1 to n, the flow out, multiplied by the enthalpy out. So that's a general thermodynamic or energy balance. steps in that, but we showed that for many systems WS is approximately zero and can be neglected. We also derived a term called delta CP, that is also approximately zero for many systems. substituted in um, the heat capacities. And we got 
a fairly important equation that we're going to use in tonight's class as our starting point, but, and it's also the starting point for all thermal balances around any reactor. That equation looks uh, is a Q dot minus F A naught times term I'll call C P naught and define the net T minus T zero minus minus the heat of reaction at a reference temperature. This is an important equation that comes as a result of this general balance. It's clearly not obvious how we get from this equation on the whiteboard or the get on the blackboard, but there's, there's several substitutions where we sub in our heat capacities and we make those simplifications, and that's the result we get. I just uh, add here that CP0 is equal to the ratio of the flows coming in multiplied by the heat capacity. So that's a standard shortcut that we use just so we avoid writing that sum several times. This term appears, appears quite a few times. So I'll, I'll make a note here. This is, the, this is an algebraic equation. we can sometimes make is if Q, if the system's adiabatic, we can call that uh, Q dot is set to zero. applying this equation to a CSTR system. And just to, to introduce that again, I'll just quickly recap the CSTR's equation, the design equation. So our previous uh, derivation for CSTRs, we've got inlet flow coming into the reactor, and we've got outlet flow and outlet conversion. And in the past, we've simply said that it's operating isothermally, that my inlet temperature T0 is simply the outlet temperature T. Well, that's, that's certainly an oversimplification. For, for some important reactions, even liquid phase reactions, that's not true. There is heat released or heat required in endothermic reactions, and so we cannot make that simplifying assumption anymore. So we, we often need to supply heat to the reactor or remove heat from the reactor in order to maintain our desired point of operation. So let's just take a look then at the, at the or just recap, I should say, the design equation.
the design equation for CSTR is that the volume is equal to FJ naught minus FJ over the rate of species J reacting. Or we could also write it as V is FA naught multiplied by the conversion X over minus RA. So for a given species A as my basis, I could write that in terms of conversion and the inlet flow. So you may start to see where this is heading. This is an algebraic equation as well. Okay, so we, we make distinctions between algebraic equations and differential equations. That equation there in the box for a CSTR is an algebraic equation. Up here, we've got an algebraic equation as well. That now tells me our temperature will change in a system with respect to conversion. So notice this equation up here is a function of temperature T, a whole lot of constants, and also conversion X. Okay, so there's a T and an X in that equation over here. In this equation over here, there's an X in my conversion, but there's also an implicit temperature. RA, my rate, is a function of temperature. I need to know the operating temperature of my system in order to calculate the rate of reaction, specifically to get the rate constant. So this algebraic equation over here is also a function of temperature and also a function of conversion. So this algebraic equation was derived from a mole balance. Whereas this algebraic equation over here is derived from an energy balance. Now you can see why in 3D we teach about solving sets of nonlinear equations in multiple variables. We've got a nonlinear equation potentially over there and a, a nonlinear equation down here. Two unknowns, temperature and conversion, in two equations. Which we need to solve. Now there's a bit more information here. Let's come back to the CSTR and just add on the diagram. What where the energy flows are in the system. If we, do, if we use a CSTR, there's multiple ways of supplying energy to the reactor or removing energy from the reactor. The most common is to use a jacket. So the jacket around the reactor is then used to, to supply heat into the system. And so we, we have a heat transfer medium, entering at, let's call this T ambient 1, and then leaving again at T ambient 2. So if we were running an exothermic reaction in there, we would be using cooling water, and T ambient 1 is the entry temperature of my cooling water, and T ambient 2 would be that cooling water leaving at a slightly higher temperature. This area over here, area of contact A is the area of contact. So that's my heat transfer surface area. There's another configuration for supplying heat or removing heat from CSTR and that's using cooling coils or heating coils. So that's immersed in the system and with the agitation provided it provides different heat transfer coefficients but it, and, and closer to the, closer to the con, um, area where the heat is taken away from or removed. But you'll see both configurations. Jackets are, are, are very common as well. So let's take a look at um, how we can model that heat coming in and out. The standard equation for this is Q dot is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area for heat transfer T ambient 1 minus T ambient 2 divided by the log of heat temperature that it is T minus T ambient 1 T minus 
minus T and get two. We also have from an energy balance on that on that heating system, the heating coil and or jacket, we can derive that Q, the rate of heat transfer, is equal to the mass flow of the heat transfer medium, so I'll call it HTM, multiplied by the heat capacity of that heat transfer medium, so that's water, it would be the heat capacity of water, multiplied by T ambient 1 minus T ambient 2. So HTM is heat transfer medium. M dot is the mass flow of that heat transfer medium. So it would be in kilograms per second in SI units. And then CP dot, uh, CP HTM is the heat capacity. And that would be in joules per kilogram heat transfer medium. So Fogler, I'll, just, I'll make a note here, Fogler calls this M dot C and CPC. But it gets confusing if you've got A, B, C, D as one of your species lying around, then you've got heat capacity of C and you've got heat capacity of C. I'm not sure what's what anymore. So I, and also it's, it's, it's also wrong to call it heat capacity of coolant. C is implicitly referring to it as a coolant. It's not a coolant. In many situations, that's a, heat transfer medium to heat the system as well. So a more correct terminology is heat transfer medium, not necessarily for cooling, it could be very well heating and end up doing a reaction. <coughs> CSTRs, we flow that coolant or that heating medium at a pretty fast flow rate. We don't like to flow that heat transfer fluid slowly through the jacket. In other words, we don't want a high temperature difference between T ambient 1 and T ambient 2. It seems a little counterintuitive. Why would we go for small temperature differences? Well, if we heat up that heat transfer medium, we have to cool it down again to reuse it again in the future. So the more heat we add to it, it, it can become expensive to, to, to undo again. Or we're wasting it down to the drain for just water. So what we prefer to do is run generally at higher flow rates, but with small temperature differences. And so it's, it's fairly common to see the assumption made that that the ambient temperature 1 is similar to the ambient temperature 2. And that actually leads to some simplifications. We get, get rid of some of the nonlinearity over here. So fairly common to assume that those ambient temperatures are close to each other. And we'll simply just call that T A and E. And then that simplifies our equations for that heat transfer rate quite substantially. So the Q dot then simplifies to UA times T minus uh, T ambient minus T. So 
let's just make sure our, our units, use units, are lots per meter squared Kelvin. And A is meter squared equal to the heat transfer error. is the heat capacity multiplied by the mass flow rate multiplied by the temperature difference. That's telling me if I do an energy balance on the flow into my system, the flow out of my system, that's equal to the flow of heat added to the system. So it's, a, it's simply from an energy balance. It's the left and the right hand side of the energy balances. So rather than writing one big equation on the board, it's the back into the parts. So this, the MCP delta T is a term that we're familiar with. MCP dt is a term familiar to energy flow in and out of the system. And this is the net heat transfer in and out. So whatever energy is transferred across this barrier, across the heat transfer surface area, is taken out of the system through the heat transfer medium. Okay, so what we can derive then is, let's go back to our CSTR equations. I'll call this equation A over here. We can derive the second equation now, B, from this heat transfer. So equation A over there is from a mole balance. Equation B from my energy balance. So this is where this comes from. There's an extra step in there. If you take this equation here with the log, re-express it in terms of T ambient two. So now you have T ambient two is equal to and on the right, on the right hand side you get this big messy exponential because you've now solved for T ambient two. Substitute T ambient two in over here, and then you get Q dot is equal to that, and then you make that simplification you get. The reason why, when you're seeing it like here, absolutely, if you make that simplification, none of this makes sense because if T ambient 1 is T ambient 2, you get no heat transfer. Same thing here. So, you're liberated with the zero as well. But what you get is if you substitute T, solve this with T ambient 2, sum it into the second equation over here, and then you make the simplification that at very high flow rates, these temperatures are approximately equivalent, you get a simplification to that. When, this is, when you look back at the raw data, it's not uh, the raw form is not going to work out. Yeah. My purpose in this class is to explain what's in the text, but the details are there for you to go through a little bit more if you want to fill in those blanks. 
So where we are here right now is we've got an equation up here on the board that's in terms of a whole lot of constants. So my E transfer coefficient's a constant, A is a constant, FA naught's a constant. I know my ambient temperature, that's a constant. P capacities are a constant, T naught's a constant. Heat of reaction is a constant. My only unknown is T here and X. These are my unknowns. So this is, let's just emphasize again from an energy balance. Over here, I've got this equation over here. This is from the mole balance. Also a function of conversion. Let me just make one more simplification to allow us to work a little bit more easily with these equations. We introduce some new notation. So, to help uh, make our life a little easier and not write on such long equations, we define two new variables. One kappa and it's equal to u times a multiplied by uh, divided, I should say, by fa naught and cp naught. If you look at that, it's uh, kappa is dimensionless. So the units cancel out. We also define a new variable called tc. And that's actually defined in terms of kappa. So it's kappa multiplied by t ambient plus my inlet temperature to my reactor divided by 1 plus kappa. You can also show that kappa is positive. Always positive. And if I make that uh, substitution, I can rewrite that equation here on the whiteboard on the left to something a little simpler. Conversion is the heat capacity at the CP naught, 1 plus kappa multiplied by T minus TC, all divided by the negative heat capacity. I will uh, just point out here that this is a function that's x is A plus BT, so it's actually a linear equation. The equation of a straight line telling us exactly how temperature, if I've given a temperature, I can calculate my conversion based on this energy balance. What is TC? TC is this new variable to find out here. Yeah, it just simplifies things for us. Right? So rather than subbing in everything and we create these intermediate variables. And also, there's, uh, there's some value to it. So, I'll also just make a note here. So, B is positive for exothermic reactions, and obviously negative for exothermic reactions. Given our volume B, 
find T and X. And I just wanted to show from a from a graphical method how we can how we might do that. Take that equation A, the green line. This is for a fixed volume, but I've got, I can change some things in there. I can change my flow to the reactor, the rate of FA0 flowing into the reactor. I can change things quite substantially for the green line. What it will do in many situations is it can shift it along to a point so that you get something along the lines of. states can occur in the CSTR. 
That's surprising for, for some people. You're, up, you're operating stably and you can get very different conversions and temperatures leaving that reactor depending on where you operate. So if every one of these points on this intersecting line leads to a different temperature as well as a different conversion. This blue line, this S-shaped line that I've drawn over here, will shift depending on your flow coming into your reactor. So sometimes you may not notice multiple steady states. Other times when you're operating at higher flow rates, you start to observe your, your system moving from one steady state to another steady state. Some of these steady states are unstable. Right? The system does not like operating at them. There's a tendency for it to operate at a different steady state and it moves, around, moves away to one of the ultimate steady states. There's a tremendous amount of study around this. Um, some of it's just theoretical, but some of it's of actually tremendous practical use because if, for example, this steady state up here, it clearly leads to higher conversion. But if it's an unstable steady state, the system will tend to move away from it to one of the other steady states. So there's a tremendous amount of work and insights and modeling and particularly process control that's done to force the system to an unstable steady state. So you, will, you may, may come across this in your career one day, the terminology stable steady state and unstable steady state. And the system desire to switch from, from, from one to the other. So this is, a, by no means I, have I gone through the details to, to get to the derivation of these curves. I don't think we've not done any numeric examples yet to show this calculations. But it points out that interesting factor of multiple steady states. It also creates a problem for you when you're solving this numerically. So what's the approach you use to solve nonlinear equations in multiple variables? What, which tools do you use? Or have you used in the past? Newton's Raphson method, and you coded those up in MATLAB or use MATLAB toolboxes to do it. What do you have to specify to solve those equations? If you give it an initial guess. Right? And so what you'll often find is that if you change your initial guess, you get a different solution. And this is why in some of these systems, you give it an initial guess and it will solve for one of those steady states. You change your initial guess and you get a different one. Okay? And you may start to well doubt the solver, but it's not the solver, it's that you very likely have multiple steady states. Okay? There's a, one important point that I will just quickly cover here in the last, uh, last minute or two just on this derivation of this blue curve, and that is I said that blue curve comes from this algebraic equation over here, but let's just take a, a, one more step inside there just to see how I, how I did that. We've got this equation over here. What you need to do is, let's just assume a first order system. First order, we have minus RA is equal to K C A naught one minus X. K, however, is a function of temperature. So K is equal to K naught e to the minus E over R T. So to generate this curve, I need to specify my temperature first, calculate K. Once I have K, I can calculate sum it in over there. And I can re-express that equation as V is equal to FA naught X over K C A naught 1 minus X. And then we derived this terminology in the previous class that um, was the FA naught over CA0 is equal to Q0. We have that derivation from that below. But then I can sub in that derivation there that FA0 and CA0 goes away, and I can write this as follows. 
can re-express that equation as conversion is equal to tau k divided by 1 plus tau k, where tau is V over Q. So how I generated this blue curve is as follows. I, I specify a temperature on my x-axis, so I pick a temperature over here. So I know T, use that temperature to calculate K. Once I know K, I can sub it in over here. I know CA naught, I know FA naught, I know V, and I can solve for X. Once I solve for X, then I will get one, one point on that blue curve. Then I go to my next temperature, solve for X, and move along. So that's how that S-shaped curve is generated. So we'll go through an example of this next class, and we'll do it on the computer just to do the calculation.